this is the thing. People constantly like to declare at different moments. The war has been lost. The war has been won. In my opinion, the dice of history is still rolling. And there is still so much we can do. A lot of people, I think, resign themselves into defeatism to remove responsibility from themselves. That, well, there's if this ends up with Ukraine losing, then they could have they were going to lose no matter what anyway. Which, that's not how history works. If you take different actions, there's different points where you could have gone this way or you could have gone this way. You choose to go this way, that has consequences. You tell the, you don't give the Ukrainians those jets early on to help them get local air superiority or try to uh, defend their airspace better, that's going to have consequences. You block attack them shipments as the British go further than us and send the storm shadows, that's going to have consequences. When we have the most political consensus to support Ukraine, we do not get the funding necessary to do this into the long term and to be able to ship them not just 31 Abrams, which I think sometimes we treat our weapons like magic. We're going to throw out 31 tanks is going to change the war. Our tanks are good, but you need them in quantity. 300 tanks, 400 tanks. Those are the types of things that could really shift the balance of power. But there was a question of escalation and escalation. And so at all these points, we chose to go the way we did. That We're here now. And I think that some of the things we did ended up helping Ukraine a lot with our shipments. And some of the decisions we make hurt us. And I think we could have been in a much better position if we delivered these things earlier, if we got this aid to Ukraine sooner. And I don't want to do this with every decision. So I'll just focus on the aid. If we got the aid... Back in September, when we was first being really discussed, when Kevin McCarthy was still in there, because Kevin McCarthy was the first one, you got to put some blame on him, who kicked the can down the road. He said, well, uh, we're doing the budgets right now. Well, okay, let's I have this you know problem with my party right now. He was the first one to kick it down the road. And when somebody initiates kicking something down the road, it gets much easier to keep kicking and keep kicking and keep kicking. Because now you've established the precedent. Yeah. Exactly. It was at that time that the Battle of Evdivka was being fought. And if Divka was a Ukrainian salient that gave them access or range closer to the city of Donetsk, which the Russians took back during 2014-2015 period. And this was a salient that the Russians had tried to take for six, seven, eight years, and it failed again and again and again. It, it, was, it became almost like a, a city of legend in Ukrainian military history. Oh, you're going down to Avdivka, the city that's held out again and again and again through all these assaults. And so the Russians got it in their head that they wanted to take Avdivka. Some say it was for political reasons, because since it had so much symbolism, if, if Putin could take Avdivka, then going into the elections, he could point to it and say, look, we have victories, we have victories. Others would say that, and I'm one of these as well, that the Russians still very much want to take more land, if not all of Ukraine, if they can. And so if they keep pushing to take the rest of the Donbass, of Divka's part of the Donbass, it's one of the cities they eventually would have to go through. And they ended up taking probably like 30 to 40,000 casualties trying to take of Divka. One of the Russians that published a report about it um, literally killed himself because the numbers were so bad that the government wanted him to shut up about it. And so he put a gun in his mouth and he blew his brains out because the numbers were so bad. And that was early on. So before all the casualty numbers had even come in and he did that and more people have died since then and offensives. The Ukrainians also lost a lot, but they said multiple times during that battle because they did eventually lose of Deepka. They lost the fortress. It was a big morale blow to Ukraine. Ukraine decided they didn't want to do another battle of Bakhmut because they just didn't have the manpower to dedicate to holding it street by street, room by room. And so they pulled out and they said openly that our artillery shortage heavily impacted our decision to pull out and we couldn't have, and we probably would have been able to either hold it longer or maybe who knows permanently maybe they would have been able to win the battle who knows if they had it now now again i don't know cuz i don't like alternative history scenarios but i will say this if they had more shells more russians would have been lost during the assault and they probably could have held of Divka at least longer, making it a bigger problem for the Russians, making them have to expend more resources, more tanks, more BMPs, which they did already expend in high numbers. But these are opportunities to wear down the Russian war machine that don't disappear every day. And it was an opportunity we could have taken advantage of more, but we decided to sit on our hands. And when people talk about like the process of like, oh, well, you know, you need to get everyone support and this is democracy and how it works. This is a war. This isn't a bill about, like, are we going to ban this book that has too many boobs in it? Or, you know, this book who, you know, are we go? Oh, are we going to make Budweiser uh, the America, the America's enemy? Like, this is not some rinky dink domestic political issue that can be picked up, put down, picked up, put down whenever. It's not if a you don't solve the issue now, people issue. die. 
if you do not solve right. the issue now, people die, battles are fought, whether we want to view it or not. Just because it's not on TV doesn't mean the fighting has stopped. And I feel like a lot of people in Washington took on that perception. That's not how you win a war or be a reliable ally. And let me just say, it's not just the Ukrainians that are looking at this too. South Koreans are looking at this. I have Taiwanese friends who follow this every day because they think for obvious reasons that this could relate to America's reliability and supporting them. And so it's, I mean, even though we've sent the aid, damage has already been done and probably will not be undone to American credibility for a long time. No, yeah. So it's not, yeah, it's not a BS messaging culture war nonsense like the like Biden's coming for your gas stove, that sort of bullshit um, uh, from which Republicans can launch their latest culture war. It is substantive. And to your point, even if we grant the premise that, oh, it's about consensus building and it is about popular support, uh, backing Ukraine and their resistance against Russia still has popular support from the vast majority of Americans and really even a, a majority support from Congress. See, that's that's the thing that's kind of fucked up 73%. about our system. percent. That was the final total. 73 percent. Right. So so you think about this. I mean, obviously, it has more Democratic support than Republican. But again, when you combine the bipartisan coalition in both chambers, it's an overwhelming and decisive majority. That's the problem. The Republican Party, particularly in the House, have become this, you know, dysfunctional minority. And obviously, the, the Republicans have had a, a vested interest in terms of just broader electoral politics, in terms of enshrining minoritarian rule. I mean, they haven't won a popular vote for the presidency, but one time in the past 30 something years. Uh, it, it really is gross. And, and I think we often, I mean, I even think I do it myself in a, in a way when I think about this stuff, you know, it is a matter of life and death. And it's pretty it's pretty easy to gloss over it because it's life and death over there, right? But it was an absolute moral pitfall on what they did, on what the Republicans did here. And that's why I go back to saying, I mean, for if, if it can extract meaningful concessions from Mike Johnson, um, I'm happy to pat him on the back if that will actually get us consistent results. But as far as just the moral value of congratulating Mike Johnson, that guy's a fucking loser. As far as I'm concerned, he's complicit in whatever consequences the Ukrainians face as a result of the six month shortage, just as much as Kevin McCarthy is. But that's my take on it. Um, but I'm also I'm also that asshole who doesn't think that uh, Mike Johnson deserves uh, or not Mike Johnson. Uh, Vice President Mike Pence deserves like the presidential medal of honor because he decided not to try to overturn a free and fair election. It's like, dude, you did your fucking job. What do you want? You know what I mean? Like, I mean, I'm glad you did, but you're not a hero. You're not George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Mike Pence, you know, or FDR. So um, that's my take on it.